Okay, now we're going to do something from this book right here called Food, Mood, and IQ by me, Pete Rogers. We're on chapter three. This chapter is called What's Interesting in Psychology? Food Allergies, Reactions, Sensitivity, Rebound Hypoglycemia, and Behavior. And so the gist of this chapter is that there's conventional psychology, and a conventional psychology is basically the priest of modernism. Whatever new silliness, BS comes along, like new pronouns or some other nonsense, they immediately adapt it. They don't think about it. They don't question it. They just immediately adapt it. So they are part of establishment, gaslighting, and nonsense, okay? There has been historically some good research, and I'll, I'll get into all of these things. All right, but we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll make sense, but that's kind of where we're going, that there's an alternative universe of ideas and thoughts and uh, treatment options in psychology that are not widely known, and this book's going to go through those things. But if, just for starters, we'll see this picture here of two parents. And you can see the parents love the baby, okay? You, you can't help loving your kid. And that's why the parents are the best person in the world for that baby, even if they're both complete functional illiterates because they love that kid. Name of the paintings, Love the Parents by uh, Jean Bouland. Okay. Uh, who are the best people to help children? The parents, of course. Why? Because they love that kid. They will do what is right for that kid, no matter what the financial issues are involved. Okay, versus, you know, you know some uh, pediatric psychologist, psychiatrist, they're going to drug the crap out of the kid, make some money off them. Okay. Love is the most powerful therapy. Thank God for my mother. Oh, by the way, if you haven't gone through yet, you got to read the last chapter, chapter two. There's a video about that. Everything in the book will make sense if you've seen chapter two. It's the, be it's the best chapter in the whole book, I think. Okay. I love my mother more than anyone else in the world. What, when she said to me that if I was going to kill myself, I should kill her first, that snapped me out of the crazy, ruminating, negative, lo thinking loser spiral. It made me realize that my life didn't belong just to me. It also belonged to her and to the family, and that anything I did would affect her and them. I would never do anything to make my mother unhappy. Uh, my mom did exactly the right thing for me. Her love energized me. It said that no matter what happens, my love for you is more important than anything else. Unconditional maternal love, that's what I needed at that moment. And what I'm saying here too is that um, every kid needs that, you know, and benefits from getting that from a mother. Uh, from a father, you tend to get, you know, you get love, but you get more of an objective uh, perspective on the world, okay? There's been this modern thing of trying to pretend that men and women are the same, and that's totally nonsense. You know, everybody knows their mother and father are different. Everybody knows their brother and sister are different. Their aunt and their uncle are different. It's ridiculous to try to pretend they're the same. That's uh, not in anybody's best interest to do that. Okay, um, and now we're going to get into something a little bit different, like Monty Python, something completely different. And I'm using the metaphor here of Clint Eastwood, the good and the bad and the ugly in psychiatry. Okay. So, you know, some of the good stuff in psychology is the research that had been done. You know, things like the Stanford experiment, you know. Um, in psychology and psychiatry, the good research shows things that help people to be healthier. One thing I'll talk about is a guy by the name of Chris Palmer. He's a physician psychiatrist over at Harvard. And you're probably wondering, how did a white guy with a name like Chris get hired at Harvard? The way he talks, I think he's homosexual. That's the only way he can get promoted. There's so much hatred of a, a white Christian male at Harvard. It's not even funny. Um, so I'll bet you that's how he got in. I'm just guessing that based on his mannerisms. I don't actually know the guy. Um, anyways, he does say some interesting things. He says that he thinks most mental illness is related to metabolic problems. He says that the brain-body separate duality concept is false meaning that the brain and the, and the body are not separate. Something that affects the body can affect the brain, and I totally agree with that. And he thinks for the brain to be healthy, you should have healthy metabolism. He thinks a bad diet leads to decreased mitochondrial function and that this can cause mental illness. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I like the fact that he's saying that he, this ties in to mental illness in his opinion because he had a patient who fixed their diet and made dramatic progress with their mental illness. So that's a big statement that he thinks... Things that are harmful to mitochondrial function can cause mental illness. 
He even goes beyond that and he says some drugs make people worse because they damage mitochondria. And it takes big balls for psychiatrists to say that because lots of their drugs damage mitochondria. Their antipsychotics damage mitochondria like Haldol. Many of their antidepressants like the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, damage mitochondria. So he's, he's getting on you know thin waters here going down this path. But he finds a way to get out of it. I'll show you. So, and also, I want you to get this thing that he said. So he says that he thinks things that inhibit mitochondria might be causing psychiatric illness. All right, that's going to come back and be a funny statement. Okay, the entire field of psychiatry is based on selling drugs, and like I said, many of them inhibits mitochondria. Okay, so here's his book, Brain Energy, okay, by Christopher Palmer, Harvard psychiatrist. He calls it a revolutionary breakthrough in understanding mental health, improving treatment for anxiety, for depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, okay, post-traumatic stress disorder, and more, okay? Okay, here's one paper along those lines. Uh, you know, harmful effects of THC from marijuana. So he says, this is why marijuana can cause mental illness, because it's damaging the mitochondria. The THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, or cannabinol, however you want to pronounce it based on the context, uh, also alcohol. They can be toxic to mitochondria. They'll decrease mitochondrial function. They'll increase reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Here's another paper showing that marijuana can cause cognitive defects. By the way, I think marijuana is quite toxic to the brain. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There's always a bunch of you know poorly educated BS artists that try to pretend it's good for the brain. It's crazy. Okay, another paper showing marijuana toxic to the brain, damaging the mitochondria. Here's a third paper showing that marijuana is toxic to brain mitochondria. Um, it inhibits mitochondria. It can kill neurons in the hippocampus. Bad, bad, bad. It's for chumps. Okay, CBD cannabidiol, cannabidiol is a major component of marijuana. It also inhibits mitochondrial function. So Palmer made the clever statement that he thinks that's why marijuana can cause psychotic breaks and can cause mental illness because it can because it's toxic to mitochondria. Okay, and there's lots of things that are toxic to mitochondria. Once you start going down this path, look at the previous lectures I've given about mitochondrial inhibitors. Lots of things are toxic to mitochondria. Processed foods toxic to mitochondria very often because it's going to have fungal inhibitors in there. Like you look at, uh, you know, the fake processed foods that sit on the shelf for a year and don't spoil. They're full of fungal inhibitors. Fungal inhibitor means mold inhibitor. Very often that's a mitochondrial uh, inhibitor. Okay, the food dyes very often are mitochondrial inhibitors. Okay, um, so Dr. Palmer says, we know that mitochondrial dysfunction is related to diabetes. Yeah, but here's what's funny. He's going to recommend a high-fat diet, but, you know, High-fat diets are the number one thing that causes diabetes, so it's stupid. So what I'm basically saying about this guy, you know, he knows a lot about psychiatry to be a Harvard psychiatrist for years, but he doesn't know hardly anything about nutrition to be recommending a high-fat diet when he's worried about mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, he also thinks that mitochondrial dysfunction is related to autism, to other mood disorders. On his book, he listed OCD, uh, depression and anxiety, and bipolar. I think there's reasons for that, things that inhibit mitochondria and can put that neuron in a stressed out state whereby it's less able to generate energy, ATP, to pump the calcium out of a cytoplasm. So you can increase cytoplasm calcium by increasing glutamate, but you can also increase cytoplasm calcium by decreasing the number of ATP available to pump it out. So it can have a similar effect. Okay, but he attributes mitochondrial dysfunction to autism, to being related to autism causation, mood disorders, depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia. Okay, and like I said, he kind of reminds me of Thomas Seifried. So Thomas Seifried is the guy who was kind of brilliant for some of his research on the metabolic theory of cancer. So he's another guy who says mitochondrial dysfunction increases your risk of cancer. But I think they then subsequently go into stupid land because then they both recommend high-fat diets. Well, high-fat diets inhibit mitochondria. Read the Michael Brownlee paper about causation of diabetes. Duh. So anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. So they kind of get halfway there, do something smart, and then they screw it up. Okay, well, my hat's off to them for recognizing the importance of mitochondrial inhibition. By the way, like I said, I, I went through all the, the papers and found 60 causes of mitochondrial inhibition. So hats off to them for that. Bravo. Uh, but while these are some brilliant insights, there's a big problem when it comes to nutrition. Both of them are ignoramuses. They both recommend the ketogenic diet. Stupid, you know. 
How is a ketogenic diet stupid? Let me count the ways. It's low in fiber, so you get constipated, low in potassium and magnesium and nitrate, so you're vasoconstricted, not good. That means your arteries are narrowing, and it's high in fat, which is obesogenic, makes you fat, diabetogenic, increases diabetes risk, atherogenic, increases atherosclerosis, plugging up arteries, which is not good for the brain, carcinogenic, hypertension inducing, bad for the brain. It's an immunosuppressant, bad for the body. High in animal protein, so it's also in that sense atherogenic and carcinogenic. Um, and one thing too, Dr. Joseph Witt Doring um, is a guy who has a good uh, YouTube channel called just Dr. Joseph, and um, he's got a lot of good videos on there about problems with psychiatric drug. He talked about how a bilified drug causes a chemical lobotomy. That was a good video. Oh, one last point I want to say about ketogenic diet. What's the only good thing long-term? Short-term, you can learn lose weight on any diet, including the ketogenic diet because you're dehydrated, like an Atkins diet, but paleo-keto. But what's the only good thing about it long-term? Uh, because you're so constipated, you save money on toilet paper. Stupid. Okay. Um, Let's see, Dr. Joseph, he also has a bunch of interviews. One was with this lady who's about 30 years old who said she started out smoking marijuana, the gateway drug to get you into other bad drugs and stupid behavior, and then she started using psilocybin mushrooms. This led to a psychotic episode. I don't know if it was the mushroom or the marijuana. And then in an emergency room, they started treating her with antipsychotic medications, which caused um, a partial lobotomy. Okay, She lost her ability to feel emotional about almost anything, it made her dull, apathetic, made her unemployable, it's ruining her marriage, it's making her family very sad. So anyways, that Dr. Joseph guy, he's a real smart psychiatrist, he knows a lot, he, he recognizes the truth of how dangerous many psychiatric medications are. So if you want to see good videos about psychiatric medications, that's one good place to go. Dr. Joseph, J-O-S-E-F, um, he's got videos showing what a disaster some of these antidepressants, benzodiazepine, antipsychotic medicines are. Uh, also, you know, he doesn't know anything about nutrition. You know, good luck finding a conventional doctor that knows nutrition. But he is good on psychiatry topics, and his heart's in the right place. I sense he's really trying to help people. Okay, so that's um, it for this, uh, the beginning of Chapter 3. I'll do it in several parts. It's a long chapter. hope that was helpful.